celebrating this great feast of the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, today, uh, we have this building wonderfully uh, adorned uh, with uh, beautiful flowers for Easter, but the best adornment in this place is you. And uh, seeing you all here today, there are first Easter uh, since 2019, really. And uh, we welcome those who are worshiping with us uh, uh, remotely on YouTube. Good to have you with us here also at St. James on this, the uh, 17th of April in the year of our Lord, 2022. So we're going to follow the order of service as you have it in your bulletin. Uh, we get to sing the Gloria, which we've not had for a while, uh, after the opening part of the liturgy. And then I think we're going to have a children's time up here before the scripture readings and after the collect for the day. Let's say that greeting again. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. May his grace and peace be with you. May you draw our hearts with joy. We pray, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth, Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. As we stand together, let us pray our collect for Easter Day. Lord of life and power, through the mighty resurrection of your Son, you have overcome the old order of sin and death and have made all things new in him. May we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, reign with him in glory, who with you and the Holy Spirit is alive, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated, and uh, Sue's going to give me a hand, and we're going to invite the young people to come, uh, those who feel comfortable to do so, uh, come up and join us up front. Hey, thanks, Brooke. And we're going to sit right down here. Thank you also. Thanks for the big kids to come and support the little kids. That's great. Have a seat. Well, um, does anybody know what a pasanka is? This is the world's largest pasanka. I think it weighs 5,000 pounds. And uh, Jill and Samuel and I have seen it. It's in Vagerville, Alberta. Um, but actually, Pasankas are Ukrainian. And so before we hear the word of God about Easter today, uh, we wanted to talk about this. What would you call that if I didn't tell you it was a Pasanka? Yep. 
A big egg, it is, it's a giant egg. This one's made out of steel and all kinds of other things, but it's gorgeous, eh? <laughs> Pretty neat. So a pasanka is a very special kind of egg. Do you know why people have eggs at Easter? Chocolate eggs, colored eggs, anybody? No? Well, what comes out of an egg? Chicks, right, and do you know when chicks are often born? In the spring. Lots of baby things are born in the spring. Well, chicks are born all through the year, I suppose. But, um, but people know what's inside an egg, and when you see an egg by itself, maybe a brown one or a white one, they look kind of like a rock, right? They're just a, a rock. They're kind of dull looking. And if you crack them open and hold one half in your hand, what does it look like? If you were a very tiny person. <laughs> a cave, that's right. So it's not an accident that Easter and the empty tomb of Jesus, the cave of Jesus, and an egg, an empty egg, all look very similar. So that's one of the many reasons why. Flowers come in the spring, uh, new things are born in the spring, and uh, life comes out of an egg, and that's what Easter is about. It's about life coming out of something that looks like it's dead or just nothing. And so to mark that in a very, very special way, the people of Ukraine, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, used to tell stories, they used to tell legends about um, where colored eggs came from. And I'm going to read you like two of these little legends, just two. Um, one is about uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, and um, when Jesus was taken away, um, he, uh, he um, and, and you know, they were going to take him to the cross, um, she wept, and her tears made little speckled stop, spots, um, and they turned beautiful colors on eggs. And that's one of the, one of the legends. Um, uh, another is that Jesus' own blood <coughs> dripped on the stones that were below the cross, and they became red, uh, something called krashankas, which are like colored stones that look like the eggs, the pasankas, and Mary stood by and her tears dropped onto the stones and the legend says they became pasankas, they became beautiful colored eggs. So we want to help you do some of that and Sue has brought uh, some really gorgeous um, eggs that are, they're, they're kind of photos of real eggs. Somebody decorated these and you can see they have all kinds of different symbols on them. They have fish and they have, they have chickens they have crosses, they have triangles, they have flowers, and every single one of those things has a meaning. So when someone is painting, they're also thinking about kind of good things in life. Um, so the birds, well, as I said, the birds make us think of spring, uh, baby birds being born in spring. There's all kinds of symbols of birds. You can, you can find them on some of those. Um, a rooster uh, is about... Um, uh, making new chickens. Um, it's about fertility. Um, there's uh, uh, horns, ram's horns. Uh, that's uh, uh, about perseverance, sticking at things even when they're hard. Fish are a symbol of Jesus, you know. Um, it's a long time a symbol of Jesus is, is a fish, and I'll tell you about that another day. Um, uh, the triangle uh, reminds us of of the Holy Trinity, uh, but also heaven and earth and people were all bound together. A diamond makes us think of fields um, in, uh, you know, uh, farmer's fields uh, where we grow things. Heart, what do you think a heart means? Love, that's right. Hearts mean love. And there's lots and lots of these. And so Sue's got um, a bunch of things that could be cut out, and there's way more uh, interpretations and meanings. And some of them are on these sheets that Sue's going to give you. Um, and those, um, uh, we can, well, you can all have a couple of these. So you can take uh, a couple of those just to give you some ideas of how pretty they are. And then you can take um, some of these sheets. And it has some of those other symbols on them that we were talking about. And uh, you can either glue it to the back, or you can use one of those to draw things on the back. You see there's um, pine and crosses 
and sons. I saw what sons mean. That was a kind of an interesting thing. Um, what did the son mean? Do you remember that, Sue? Hmm. Fire or life-giving heat, it says here. Yeah. Lots of wonderful symbols. So they all mean something. And uh, you can choose the ones you like the best. You don't have to worry about the meaning. And so Sue's got a pack of uh, crayons. Um, and it could be for like a family or, or one person. OK, there's one for everybody. So do you want to come forward and take some colored eggs that uh, you like? And um, you can choose it by the symbol that are the colors. And then you can work on them here. Uh, but eventually, you might want to cut those ones out. Squeeze on in there, your brother won't mind. <laughs> there you go. Take a couple and leave some for everybody else. There you go. That's good. Oh, yes. Af and after you've decorated them, you could bring them back for the, the godly play tree downstairs. Oh, yeah, you've got to take the activity pack. And then maybe, well, you're listening to the Bible being read and me talking. Uh, you could be working on something fun yourselves. Thanks, Sue. All right. Yeah, now Sue's going to go and read. That's right. <laughs> there you go, Sue. Excellent. Did you want some of these? A reading from the book of Acts. Then Peter began to speak to the Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, God.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel procession. be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly Two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? They remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
loving God, grant each of us a word from your word in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, You know, as I get older and uh, am still in the saddle in full-time ministry, I find myself more and more often awake at night and in the early hours of the morning. Perhaps some of us know this experience. No matter how many times it happens, if I can see a bit of light coming under the bedroom door or around the curtains, I wonder if it is already morning and that my alarm is about to go off to tell me it's time to get up and get going. It's hard to be sure. Sometimes it's only that first light, that almost dawn, uh, when the sun is not up and you can't really see things clearly or tell what the weather's gonna be like or tell what time it is. I even have the, uh, the face of my clock darkened to help my sleep, so I had no idea. And um, though I used to not think of it in this way, it was just annoying, uh, someone this week has inspired me to start referring to this kind of pre-dawn time as mysterious. So if you went to bed knowing that something unresolved or painful or uh, just exhausting was still true, and you were looking forward to that time when the next day would dawn, when you hopefully would see more clearly or feel more like engaging or finding new energy in a brand new day, this is not yet it. This is not it. You know what I mean? That time? This is the time, according to St. Luke's account of the Easter story, that the events of Easter began in that pre-dawn light. There was, a not, there was not yet an expectation of anybody in the story at this point uh, that any good would come out of the events of Friday or Saturday. And we'll see that some in the company of Jesus' followers are still stuck in their place of woundedness and disappointment, without hopes, and, uh, and with their once bold faith in complete tatters. But a few faithful women, St. Luke tells us, choose to come to the place where they laid the body of Jesus in that pre-dawn hour anyway. They were no less hurting or grieving, their hopes were no less dashed or all but gone, but they came anyway to do for the one they loved one last kindness. Now some have wisely said, as uh, I mentioned on, on Friday, that if we try to explain Easter, we try to sum it all up, then we reduce it to a formula, or maybe it just becomes a kind of automatic occasion to bring back the trumpets and the fanfare, like some of our great Easter hymns. You know, like on Remembrance Day, when you hear the last post, and though there's a, a minute of silence, then there's revel. You know it's coming. And that's the end of that little act of remembrance. Um, and if that is all that Easter is, that, that uh, final fanfare, then we empty the day of its mystery, of much of its meaning, and maybe even its greatest importance in our lives. So back to the women in their early or pre-dawn mission. They had no idea how they were going to do what they planned on that Sunday morning, to do that reverent work with the spices for Jesus' body. And when the problem was solved uh, by um, uh, an already opened tomb, Luke says they were perplexed, good word, or left wondering. They didn't know what to make of what they'd found, and that feeling soon turned to surprise and then fear when they saw those two dazzling messengers who gently told them off for being surprised or for looking for Jesus' body in the first place. Why do you look for the living among the dead? Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Oh yeah. <laughs> he did say that more than once. And if you're reading the Bible and you get to this point, you've heard him say it over and over again, and it seemed to have absolutely no effect on those who are hearing it. Who knew that this was what he meant by that? And what does this even mean? 
And when these first witnesses ran with now some faith of their own, some newfound faith, to tell the eleven and all the rest that Jesus' tomb was empty and that he'd been raised as he said, St. Luke tells us these words seemed to the others an idle tale and they did not believe them. It was as if the women have now found their faith on a new day and they are met with the same old uh, cynicism and distrust and resistance to God's plans and purposes that are in the world all the time, even among Jesus' closest or so-called friends. In that mysterious early dawn moment, some begin to see and some don't. The darkness is still there, the denial, the crushing disappointment, the seeming last words in their hearts that are nothing but trauma and pain, and they're just too real to admit of anything else, any other possibility. The injustice of it all, the jealousy that must have led to all of that uh, horror of what we call Holy Week, the hatred, still seems to be the order of the day. We know it today, and they knew it on that day. And on top of that, there is the fact that Jesus' disciples know what they have done in these last few days, or rather what they have not done when it most counted. They had betrayed, they had abandoned, and they'd even denied him when pressed for the truth in public. Their chance to be witnesses, and they blew it. And now Jesus is gone. He's crucified and buried, and it seems as if nothing can take away their guilt and their woundedness and restore their hope. But that is not all there is. Not for them and not for us. And this is so important because the word today speaks to us and to everyone who will listen, telling us how important it is to come to this day not with a light heart, not with already prepared joy or uh, trying to put on a, a happy face or uh, a, a smiling demeanor, um, but to acknowledge first the real loneliness we feel, the real emptiness there is, the disillusionment we might be feeling, the pain and the doubt that our experiences or this morning's news um, have uh, made us feel uh, and have fostered in our hearts at one time or another. Because when we're honest about being there in that place, then those are the moments and the wonderful moments they are when God's work actually becomes most active and most evident. Not when we're at our best, but when we're at our worst. Then we're given the grace to see something more, something we've never seen before, and to believe it and to start doing something about it. Not instead of or ignoring what's going on in and around us today, but because of it. That's what Peter and the others, once outspoken and claiming undying loyalty and affirmation of who Jesus was and what he could do, that's what they needed to do as the sun was rising on that first day of the week. They needed to say yes, out loud and honestly, to all that burdened and seemed all too powerful to keep them in darkness, and at the same time to begin to look for something more. Now these disbelieving disciples had lost someone they loved. And uh, that's an experience they share with far too many of us here today. Like them, we are today grieving all kinds of loss, carrying anger uh, we might not want to admit, and we channel it in all kinds of inappropriate ways, um, carrying sorrow that is so deeply embedded in us that we don't even recognize it anymore, or maybe just feeling kind of empty. And certainly anyone with eyes to see has an awareness that that is what is happening to far too many people somewhere else in the world right now. Jesus' friends had to watch their master and their dear one suffer from a distance. Sound familiar? Unable to touch him or hold him or nurse him. Uh, that's an experience as too, of us, too many of us could say we've had with loved ones during this pandemic. Dear people in this room today, some, who
who were in hospital that we couldn't care for. Thank God they're here today. And some who we've said goodbye to forever. But that is not all. Not long after all of this, Peter, who shared our experience, would be able, as we heard in our first reading from uh, uh, Acts today, he'll be able to stand up again. And with some kind of newfound confidence, he'll, he'll say boldly and publicly, not caring who heard it or what it meant for him, you know, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us, of all people, to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. That's a far cry from it seemed to them an idle tale. The ones who betrayed, abandoned, and let Jesus down become the ones who are chosen to do what God would do next in the world, and they've handed on that mission to you and to me. By the grace of God, so much more light dawned for them, and those reluctant witnesses, honest about what had happened to them, now began to see so much more. Now, the other day I was cutting some wood in the garage, not what you would think one does in the garage, but there's a lot of wood in there, and some of it needed cutting. And there are old, musty boxes in our garage. Um, I don't invite you to go there, but uh, take my word for it. And uh, most of them I want to get rid of, but some of them have books that came from this building. And uh, I picked a few of them up, kind of splaying open in the dampness and, and musty looking, and uh, it was by Max Lucado. Some of us know Max's work. I think it's one of his first books from back in the 80s. And in it, I read a story that I'd like to share with you today. It's a story about a man who was singing in the streets of Rio de Janeiro, where Max had gone as a missionary uh, with his young wife. And th this guy who was singing seemed to have nothing to sing about. He was blind. All there were were like dark sockets in his eyes, um, rather like the man once found begging by Jesus at a town gate. And Max almost walked by the man as he was hurrying back to work from a nice lunch with his wife. But then he turned around and he went back and he said he put some coins in the man's hand and started on his way again. And then he stopped a second time. And um, he wondered whether anyone in the crowd were seeing this guy at all, let alone hearing him. And he figured that Jesus would have seen this man. And he was pretty sure he would have seen him in a way that Max wasn't really seeing him. So he watched him from a while, from a distance. He heard him sing his songs, and he watched the people dismissively rushing by him, uh, or turn their faces away as if to say, no reminders of harshness in the world today, please and thank you. And off they went. And he said, I just couldn't take it. Most didn't see him at all. So Max came nearer and asked him if he'd eaten uh, that day, and the man said he was hungry. So he bought him a sandwich and a drink, and they sat down and they talked for a while. It turns out the man wasn't born blind like that man in Jesus' story. Uh, he'd had an accident when he was young. He was almost exactly the same age as Max, but you could never tell that. He was 28. And um, for all of those 28 years, he'd lived with his parents and seven brothers and he tapped his way into the city for a few coins uh, or maybe some food day after endless day. And yet, Max says, he sang. He sang with strength and with pride and with joy. And Max wondered at first whether he really sang out of depression, he had a lot to be depressed about, um, or self-preservation, or some other utilitarian kind of reason, but no, Max concluded he sang out of a kind of contentment that he described to Max, a kind of contentment that few people in the world have, that the people rushing by, worried and distracted by their lives, um, uh, none of them seemed to have this man's contentment. He was on what I would say was the low end of a spectrum of what St. Paul wrote about once from prison to the people of Philippi. He said, I have learned to be content with whatever I have. 
I've learned the secret of being well-fed, which this man didn't know, and the secret of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Paul said. Somehow, this eyeless pauper had discovered a candle called satisfaction, and it glowed in his dark world. Somehow, uh, someone had told him, or maybe he'd told himself, or he'd heard the Spirit speaking, that tomorrow's joy is fathered by today's acceptance. Acceptance of what, at least for the moment, you cannot alter. Of all the sea of people on that street in Rio that day, Max remarked that no one else was singing, just him. And then he said this, it's a quote, and he doesn't say where it's from, but it's a wonderful one, and it's a wonderful Easter quote. Faith is the bird that sings while it is still dark. Tuck that away for an early dawn morning sometime in the future. Faith is the bird that sings while it is still dark. Max finished the story by saying, for almost a block as he went on his way, I could hear him singing. And in my mind's eye, I could still see him. But the man I saw was a different one than the one to whom I had given a few coins. Though the man I saw was still sightless, he was remarkably insightful. And although I was the one with the eyes, it was he who gave me new vision. And today, that is God's will and word to each of us on this Easter morning, that we would be honest and aware of all that hurts us and holds us back from believing, and then by his grace, to begin to see the new life and the new wholeness that is right there wherever we are at this moment. On Friday, I shared a quote from Rabbi uh, Nachman of Bratislav, back in the 18th century, who once said, there is no heart so whole as a broken heart. And we can be conscious of that broken heart on a day like Good Friday, but we could be conscious of it today, too. No wholeness, no heart so whole as a broken heart. We all of us have had our hearts broken in one way or another. We've had dark days and nights and mornings when we could not see it all that God was doing something in and around us. And the one who is broken and done away with and buried in the dark is now, on account of Easter, alive again. The crucified and counted out one is risen. And he is at work in our midst, even now. Can you see? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let us confess our faith as we say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may remain standing or kneel or be seated as is your custom for prayer. As we gather together today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're grateful to be lifting our voices in prayer with Christians worshiping the whole world over. The response to our prayers this morning will be, our glorious risen Lord, we turn our hearts to you. Lord Jesus, your resurrection showed us the way to our Father in heaven. We pray for all who are in leadership in our wider church, those who work daily on our behalf to also lead us to the Father. We pray for Justin of Canterbury, Linda, our primate, Anne, our metropolitan, Shane, our bishop, Kenneth, our priest, and for all who lead and serve in this parish. We pray for the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples in Canada, the Sacred Circle, and for Archbishop Mark MacDonald. In our diocesan family, we pray for the people of Good Shepherd Church, Barhaven, and the Reverend Margo Whitaker, and St. George's Clayton, and the Reverend Pat Blythe. And far across the world, in an area filled with strife, we especially remember today our brothers and sisters in the Church of Pakistan. Our glorious risen Lord, we turn our hearts to you. Lord Jesus, your resurrection showed us a path to follow. We pray for those who hold positions of civic leadership, who also help to guide our lives. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, and all in authority under her. For Justin, our Prime Minister, and all who hold elected positions in communities large and small across our country. And especially now, we hold before you those who are in leadership in Ukraine and in Russia. We pray that in the midst of war and violence, your voice can still be heard. Our glorious risen Lord, we turn our hearts to you. Lord Jesus, your resurrection brought the gift of peace. Sometimes that peace feels terribly elusive. So in a world very full of war and strife, we pray for all who are peacemakers. For the men and women everywhere who work to find ways to help enemies talk to one another, to seek common ground with the hope that reconciliation is possible. Today, in the land of your own birth, there is much violence and terror. In silent hope, as your word directed us so long ago, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our glorious risen Lord, we turn our hearts to you. Lord Jesus, by your resurrection, you showed us how to live generously as people of faith. Here in Perth, we remember Pastor Shirley Abramacy and the many examples of faith that she shows through her ministry at his house. We ask you to bless and to strengthen her as she reaches out in love to care for your people. 
our glorious risen Lord, we turn our hearts to you. Lord Jesus, by your resurrection, you brought healing into the world. We lift before you all who are lonely, distressed, and without hope for their future. Show each one of us where and how you want to use us to bring life and love to those who live in despair. We hold before you those we know to be in need. We pay, pray for God's grace for Bob, Claire, and Stephanie as they, pray for, as they prepare for their ordination this week. We pray for Tina, Tracy, Terry, and families as they grieve the loss of their mother. We pray for Jonathan, for Fove, Sammy, Eleanor, Kathy, Steve, Noah, Brian, Eleanor, Sadie, Scott, Mid, Dorothy, Cheryl, Ruth, Shane, Ted, Linda, Karen, Lisa, Robin, Janet, John and Hillary, Peggy, Robert, Mary, Jeff, Junie, Bet, Adam, Nancy, and the Reverend Bill Simons, and all the others that we each hold in the silence of our own hearts. We pray for the repose of the soul of Betty Sheldrick and for all who have died, especially those during this pandemic the world over. O glorious risen Lord, we turn our hearts to you. Lord Jesus, as we leave this place today to go out into the world, we pray that by the grace of your resurrection, we can each reflect your love in our families and community so that the world can know that we are your Easter people. Amen. We continue in prayer with the general confession. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. You stand and express the peace of Christ to those nearby.
offer ourselves and these gifts as we pray together, God, our strength and salvation. Receive all we offer you this day, and grant that we who have confessed your name and received new life in baptism may live in the joy of the resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I direct us all to the little instructions about communion, which are actually after all the prayers of communion, um, inviting people all to come forward to receive the sacrament or a blessing, to come forward to receive bread uh, and wine or just the bread, uh, to receive a gluten-free uh, wafer, and you can tell me that verbally. Uh, if you want to receive um, a blessing, make a sign of a cross over your over your shoulders there, and uh, if you want to receive the bread and then not receive the wine, then you can make that symbol again, and that tells the uh, chalice bearer, who will still read the words of administration to you, because it's still true for you, um, and all of those options are available to you today. And I invite you to stay standing with me until we sing the Sanctus in the middle of this prayer, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord. And then you may remain standing or kneel or be seated. And of course, the choir is going to lead us in the responses, glory to you forever and ever at periodic places in the prayer. The Lord be with you. For our life which comes from you. By your power you sustain the universe. Glory to you forever and ever. You created us to love you with all our heart and to love each other as ourselves, but we rebel against you by the evil that we do. In Jesus, your Son, you bring healing to our world and gather us into one great family. Therefore, with all who serve you on earth and in heaven, we praise your wonderful name as we sing. Holy, holy, holy Lord God, of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. suffers with the sick and the rejected. Betrayed and forsaken, he did not strike back, but overcame hatred with love. On the cross, he defeated the power of sin and death. By raising him from the dead, you show us the power of your love to bring new life to all your people. Glory to you. before he gave up his life for us, Jesus, at supper with his friends, took bread and gave you thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is given for you. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me.
gracious God, with this bread and wine, we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we offer ourselves to you in him. Send your Holy Spirit on these gifts and upon us, that we may know the presence of Jesus in the breaking of bread and share in the life of the family of your children. Father, you call us to be your servants. Fill us with the courage and love of Jesus, that all the world may gather in joy at the table of your kingdom. We sing your praise, Almighty Father, through Jesus our Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we died with you on the cross. Now we are raised to new life. We were buried in your tomb. Now we share in your resurrection. Live in us that we may live in you. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. God of life, bring us to the glory of the resurrection promised in this Easter sacrament. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Know that you are beloved of God and that he would give you eyes to see him at work in your very lives. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Would you be seated, please. Well, it is great to be with you on this Easter morning, and I'll remind us all, uh, some of us uh, kept score during Lent and knew that Sundays were our cheat days, our free days. Um, Easter is a 50-day celebration without breaks in it, so it's an indulgent day every day for 50 days. Uh, just tuck that one away. Um, I, uh, I, I want to say a, a word of thanks, uh, as I did in a way offhandedly, to our altar guild, uh, for uh, adorning this space so beautifully, and uh, for whoever had the great idea of putting a cloth behind the altar that covers the hook that I always catch myself on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ever since I got this robe, every time I walked by, I got hung up. Um, anyway, thank you. Uh, thanks to our uh, team of videographers who've had a lot of extra work uh, lately, but, uh, but uh, thanks to Al up there uh, uh, in the balcony, and uh, and to uh, all who prepared for this service of worship today. Uh, I hope I don't embarrass you by saying how wonderful it is uh, to have Ruth sitting right up front here, and Eleanor, who I don't know if she's made her way, uh, but uh, there's Eleanor. Uh, wonderful to have Eleanor with us today, too. It's been far too long. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to say thank you also to the people who drove other people to church today. Uh, I know that some of you did that. And, uh, and in one case, it was family members, um, and uh, somebody's pointing to someone else here, but uh, Mike, uh, I expect, uh, uh, and, uh, and David, and others. Uh, we are looking for people who'd be willing to do that. As people feel more comfortable coming back to worship, we have gotten a few requests for drivers, and, uh, and some of our members kind of newly need um, a, a driver to, to help them get out to worship. And now that we're able to gather together, uh, we want to go from strength to strength and, and enable those who, who can to, uh, to come and join us. We're going to continue to film the service and put it online, but as one of the wardens is always pressing me, we don't want people using the online service as an alternative to Sundays. <laughs> if you can come, we'd rather see you in person. Uh, hopefully next Sunday we'll return to having coffee. Some of you who've been away for a while might not know we had a, a flood in the building, a bur burst pipe and a flood. So we can't use most of our hall, except for godly play, the Anna Wilson room, um, my office is a wreck, uh, the, uh, the kitchen, and the downstairs kitchen, and the annex, and the meeting room all need major repairs. And um, uh, because of the persistence of our wardens, the insurance company is finally getting on it, and uh, they promise to have work begin in the next couple of weeks. So we're looking forward to that, and then we can have things downstairs and use our kitchen again. In the meantime, I'm looking for volunteers, um, and uh, people have been very generous to my discretionary fund, so I don't have to be euphemistic anymore and talk about uh, an anonymous donor, because uh, there are actually two anonymous donors, and uh, who've uh, uh, beefed up my discretionary fund so that I can pay someone to go do a coffee run to Tim Hortons, bring one of those jugs, or maybe two, um, was it 20 cuppers, and uh, say four or five cups of tea for those who like tea, and, um, and bring them so we can share coffee uh, at the entrance to the church after the 10 o'clock service. Oh yes, and beginning next week, if somebody volunteers for next week, we'd like you to bring your own mug. We'll get the paper disposable cups uh, as we need them, but we can have left 
if you bring your, your mug, and then of course you get to take it home and wash it at home. Uh, but uh, no, that's very helpful. Uh, thanks for that reminder. Uh, we want to say a word of thanks to those who contributed to our Easter flower, um, and especially in memory of a dear ones, and all of their names are listed on the bulletin on page 17. Um, too many for me to read today, but um, do read them and remind yourself of uh, these dear members of our parish family and our extended parish family. Um, we uh, uh, continue to have monthly community dinners, even though our hall is out of commission, uh, by uh, uh, Al and, and the teams who work each month. And uh, this week uh, past, it was Greg and Susan Best, and they put a thanksgiving to uh, Mike and Al and Marianne uh, for helping, and to uh, Carol Spruill as well. Um, that was last Saturday at the table. We're going to keep doing that at the table until we have a functioning hall. Um, and as I said on Friday, I believe, uh, you probably don't know this, but if you look up to the archway over this area that I'm standing in, you cannot see that there are four brand new lights, LED dimmable lights that were installed. It took three full days uh, and a new light over the, uh, the office wing as well. Uh, Wally Kuzmich and Bob Harvey uh, working alongside two electricians flat out for those days. And that was after a lot of research and experimentation and the acquiring of uh, hardware uh, before that. And uh, now we can do all kinds of funky things up here. <laughs> and um, uh, we can turn them all off. We can dim some and not some others. And it's really terrific. Uh, they even went up on a high ladder and changed a very high light bulb for us, which is, which is great. And these new ones, of course, use hardly any power and they don't produce heat, uh, which I'm very grateful for uh, up here. Now lastly, I want to remind us all that um, as we began to say last Sunday, on the 1st of May, we will be holding a special vestry meeting, something that you have to announce for three weeks in a row. So this is the second week. Uh, May 1st, following this service, so what time is it now? 11.30, about 11.20. Uh, I'm expecting the service not to be as, quite as long that day. And uh, so uh, the people at 8 o'clock hopefully will come and join us. It maybe is a 10 minute meeting. Uh, we nominate and elect or appoint uh, one or two new wardens and we um, pass a motion to give them signing authority. <coughs> that's, that's all it takes. It's a raising of hands and then a drinking of coffee. Uh, so, um, uh, if you could join us for that day, that would be helpful. It's good to have a good turnout for special vestry meetings. And as we speak, people are preparing to vote to give us permission to sell the chapel, the former chapel of St. Augustine's in Drummond. That, that building was, that had its chapel status removed at a diocesan council meeting a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this Monday, I believe, or sometime this week, uh, the property and finance of committee of the diocese have to say we are allowed to sell it. And then that is what we'll do. Eventually, uh, God willing, we will deconsecrate that building and give thanks for the many years of ministry there. But um, that's some of the news of the parish. Any other announcements? Looking for new choir members? <laughs> All, always ready to have new choir members. Uh, that's great. Well, uh, we don't have coffee today, assuming that people are on their way to other things, but we look forward to next Sunday, and, uh, and uh, welcome to those who are new and visiting with us. Let's praise God with our recessional hymn, 210.
remember the alleluias on our dismissal today and all these 50 days. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. 